Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. We left off last week at verse 9. Let me read that again. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. I made comments about certain things, certain unique doctrines uh, a lot of Bible believers hit upon, they discover, and they wonder why other churches haven't seen these same verses. Um, and one I use as an example is the subject of the fruit in the Garden of Eden. Everybody, because of American folklore, thinks it was an apple. Uh, I don't know why. I had a lady come up to me and say it couldn't have been an apple because apple trees don't grow in that part of the Middle East. Of course, she was uh, Armenian. And I don't know if she knew that culture and that uh, climate better than I did. I took her word for it. But I never thought it was an apple anyway. I think Star Trek had an episode years ago uh, where it was sort of like an eggplant. There was an, another planet that sort of mimicked the Garden of Eden. How many saw that episode way back when you were children? You saw that? But it's amazing the things that people have. I heard a Christian, a so-called Christian comedian years ago said uh, he thought if he would be tempted, it would be a peach. He likes peaches much better than apples. Well, good for you. Who doesn't like peaches? But um, the Bible makes it pretty clear, the, the summary, the conclusion you come to comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture, that the fruit in the Garden of Eden was a grape or a grapevine. When you think of a cluster of grapes, it's very easy to pull off a bunch and break one off and give to someone else, like Eve did to Adam. Who wants to put your lips on an apple someone else has just eaten? I don't, if Adam was germ conscious. But anyway, so you, say, so you offer that as a, as a peculiar doctrine that is revealed through comparing Scripture with Scripture in the King James Bible. It might... That might be a meaty doctrine because most people have never heard it. And it's new for them to try to follow the sequence of verses. And they have to be laid out very carefully for the student to learn. But you get preoccupied with those kinds of things. And it uh, means nothing. It really means nothing. It has no bearing on your salvation. It has no bearing on uh, anything else in the scriptures. But some people get obsessed and, and um, uh, occupied with unusual, quirky doctrines, quirky revelations that uh, most Christians aren't aware of because most Christians don't read their Bible as they should. And some Christians only know those quirky things, those unusual, those unique things, and they're not interested in something spiritual, that the heart be established with grace, not with meats. They're interested in the meaty doctrines they're not interested in being well grounded by grace and in the um, mercy and the compassion and the tenderness of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and his redemption of the sinner from the cross of Calvary. They're not interested in those things. And yet those things are more important than the other. They really are. Uh, I've noticed <clears throat> um, Pastor Gene Hop grew up here in our congregation and He's doing a good work in San Jose. And you can tell, because he, he posts everything online, I don't have as many videos to post as he does, but I have noticed the number of people who view his Sunday morning services with straight preaching is far fewer than the people who will click on some clickbait title that he, that he likes to throw in there, you know, what color were the Antichrist pajamas, and so yeah. forth. Um, Everybody wants to know, what color are they? You know, why? You know, but uh, very few people want to hear a straight sermon from the Bible and hear some singing uh, and those things that Christians should do together. You can tell by the number of views that are posted online. And it's the same with the videos that I post. And I, by the way, I appreciate our men doing that for us every week. But let's continue here in Hebrews 13. Let me read verses 10 through 16 today. Hebrews 13 verses 10 to 16 is where we'll stay. 
We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Notice that the we here, verse uh, 10, refers to saved Hebrews and saved Gentiles together, the body of Jesus Christ, the church. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle, verse 10. Golgotha, or Mount Calvary, is about to be spiritualized as an altar in Paul's writing here. The altar is said to be without the camp or without the gate, two expressions meaning the same thing. Uh, verse 11, the blood uh, is brought into the sanctuary from the altar of the burned, uh, burnt offering. And you can read about the details of that in Leviticus chapters 4 and 5 and through those first several chapters, about the first seven or eight chapters of Leviticus, you read about the requirements of the duties uh, put on to the priests, the different respective offerings and sacrifices. But our altar is for spiritual sacrifices. Um, no Roman Catholic altar is a proper place for any real Christian to go and think he can worship Christ. It's the uh, sacrifice of devils. It's not a sacrifice to God. It's not even true sacrifice. It's simply uh, smoke and mirrors. It's a, the Roman Catholic Mass, and having worked in the funeral business for about uh, 33 years, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of funeral masses, but the format, depending whether it's a wedding, whether it's a funeral, whether it's something else, the format is roughly the same. I've gone to more Catholic church services than a lot of Catholics have. But, <clears throat> by the way, I mean, this is a side story. I'll get back to this in a moment. When I first started working in this business in 1986, and the first time my uh, manager took me to work a funeral, a Catholic funeral, with him, we rolled the casket up to the front of the church near the, their altar, near their stage, and then it's customary for the funeral directors to genuflect down on one knee towards the cross on the wall or to whatever is on the wall, crucifix. Nowadays, it's usually some statue of some kind. Very few crucifixes are on the wall. They've got pictures of Mary, Our Lady of Guadalupe, any number of things. And I always, I, I wrestled with that. I didn't know, am I blaspheming God? Am I sinning against God by kneeling towards an altar that I don't believe in? And then I was reading my Bible in 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, Naaman the leper, the captain of the Syrian army, and Elisha tells him to go wash seven times in the Jordan River and he'll be healed. He comes back, his flesh was like a flesh of a young child, and is healed of his leprosy. And in the end of that story, Naaman knows when he goes back, he's going to have to go to the house of the false gods with his master and be expected to kneel down to the idols along with his master. And uh, Elisha says, God be with thee. And with, in, not, in not as many words, he says, don't worry about it. God sees the heart. Man only sees the outward appearance. And so once I read that and I realized Elisha was giving Naaman, assuring him that he had the grace enough to go and be required to do those things even though he didn't believe in those gods any longer. He believed now in the God of Elisha. Then I didn't feel so bad about it anymore. So now I will do it if necessary. Sometimes we simply bow forwards uh, out of respect because the people in the audience are expecting to see see it done. Because they do it, they expect everyone else to do it. 
And now someone may comment on that and say, I still shouldn't do it. Shut up. Keep your comments to yourself. You don't have the, the grace to get through something like that. I hope you get it soon. All right, let's move back to our outline here. But um, Paul writes, the bodies of those beasts, he says, are burned without or outside of the camp, verse 11. This is the operations described back in Exodus chapter 29 and also in Leviticus 4. Uh, go back, if you will, to Exodus 29. Exodus 29, and notice there, Exodus 29, verse 14. <clears throat> Here, continuing the, the description of the priest's duties. Exodus 29, verse 14. But the flesh of the bullock, and his skin, and his dung, shalt thou burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. Notice Christ is not only compared to the sacrifices on the altar, the blood on the doorposts, remember the, the night of the Passover, um, and the burnt offerings. But he's also compared here to the cast-off, discarded refuse. The skin and the dung and those uncomely uh, parts, those things that nobody wants to touch or uh, be involved in. When Christ became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, declares, <clears throat> he took our curse on himself. Galatians 3, verse 13, and as, as it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Uh, even to the extent of being likened to Satan. John 3, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And here, he's identified with the cast-off and the rejected people. For example, the lepers were restricted to live outside the camp. They could not come in and mix with uh, healthy people. So he likens himself to them in his humility. And for what purpose? Verse 12. That he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Without the gate is also without the camp. That is the boundaries of the camp that he might sanctify the people. You know, outside the camp, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, the Jews were also commanded to dig latrines. That's where they would go to the bathroom and then and cover it up to keep the camp clean. When God looked at it, he didn't want to see the pollution that came from their bodies, even uh, laying around in the camp. That he might sanctify the people. Now, in Calvinism, Here's an interesting thing to consider. In Calvinism, um, the people in this text are interpreted as the elect, the ones that God had already chosen to save in eternity past. In eternity past, according to Calvinism's doctrines, God made two eternal, he had two eternal decrees. He decided who he would one day save, and he decided that he would one day damn everyone else. So everyone has some decree of God over them. The problem is you just don't know which decree God made over you. And so it's very subjective. They see you going to church. They see you reading your Bible. You show some interest in spiritual things, a church-related thing. Well, he must be one of the elect for salvation. But if you stop reading your Bible, stop going to church, you miss the prayer meeting, you miss any number of these spiritual events that they want you to attend, well, he must have been faking it. He wasn't one of the elect at all. He's not saved after all. It's very subjective. But since nobody knows, and you know, this is one thing that always perplexed me once I learned more about Calvinism, they're always known as the, the people who believe in the security of the believer, as opposed to Arminianism, which Pentecostals um, subscribe to, that salvation can be lost. Um, Baptists normally would call themselves of the Calvinistic stripe, uh, meaning that we believe salvation is secure forever. But uh, I don't call myself either one, and neither should you. Neither of these groups has real security of their salvation. They have no absolute certain knowledge of their salvation. The Pentecostals are the Arminians because 
they think they might lose it if they're not careful through their own sin. And the Calvinist, because he doesn't know for sure if he's one of the elect to salvation. So in that respect, neither group knows for sure whether they're saved or not, or whether they can keep their salvation. We don't believe that. We believe God offered his offered the Son of, of God to whosoever will, and uh, you have a will that will either decide to receive Christ or reject Christ. Amen. I'm glad my will said yes to Jesus Christ. And if you're born again, I, your will said yes as well. Amen. So your will has to come into line with God's will. God is not willing that any should perish, but he is willing that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. Now, do you want to repent? Are you willing to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ? If so, then your will comes into line with his will, and that's where the work of God is affected. That's where it takes place. But um, Calvinism teaches that God, when Christ died, he only suffered for the, the ones God had already chosen to save, so that none of Christ's blood would be wasted on unsaved man. But um, if the sanctified, or the people here in verse 12, are only the elect, then look back at chapter 10, go back a page or so, chapter 10, verse 29. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under, underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was, he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and if done despite under the Spirit of grace. If those who are sanctified, back in chapter 13, are those who are the elect, then they're the elect here. But here, those people who apostatize and go off and end up losing their salvation, they're said to be sanctified. They must be the same elect. So you compare Scripture with Scripture, and you see that somebody's... Um, Smoking something they shouldn't be smoking, trying to tell you that God decided who he would save, who he wouldn't save. Um, <clears throat> there you have the elect apostatizing. Uh, that doesn't square with Calvinism, because they want to insist that the sanctified are those God had chosen, but when they see the sanctified uh, rejecting God and doing despite under the spirit of grace and so forth, then uh, they run into a problem. Uh, verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. There's two applications that can be made here. Uh, number one, let us Hebrews and any who have not believed in Christ yet go to Calvary and get saved. But more probable, let us Christians, uh, Jew or Gentile in spirit, um, who are outside the religious camp, outside the political camp, outside the education camp, outside the ecumenical camp, outside the uh, scientific camp, outside the social camp, go forth nevertheless, bearing his reproach. Look back at Psalm 69. Actually, we have time. Keep your finger there in Psalm 69 and go forward to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. John, chapter 2. Here the Lord Jesus goes into the temple and drives out the money changers. This is how you want to deal with a Catholic who believes in the perpetual virginity of Mary and that she had no other children. Christ didn't have brothers or sisters. All of those listed in the end of Matthew 12, the end of Matthew 13, those were his cousins of some sort. Here's how you answer that. Take someone to John chapter 2, 
And verse 16, he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now I'll go back to Psalm 69 <clears throat> to show some of those two verses. Then you take them here to Psalm 69. Verse 8 says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. And you say, well, that applies to Jesus Christ. They say, how do you know that? Look at the next verse. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. Of course, that's referring to Jesus Christ. That's all prophetic of him. David understood he would have brothers and sisters, the children of the same mother. But the reproaches that fell upon Christ, they hate God. The world hates God, but they can't get at God. So they want to attack you, who as a true believer stand to represent God, to speak for Jesus Christ, who know more of the Bible than they'll ever know. You're interested in learning the Bible. They're not interested in it. Whether it's some uh, casual acquaintance at work, whether it's your own family members, people you only see once a year at you know, family Thanksgiving, or whoever it may be, they don't like God because a knowledge of God means there are certain things God has a right to expect of you. And so uh, if they want to be ignorant, ignorance is said to be bliss. I'm happy because I don't know. Yeah, you're also going to be in for a big surprise one day because you will know. <clears throat> but so they don't want to know God, but they can't attack God directly. So they try to poke holes in your belief in God. They try to uh, condemn and, uh, and criticize the things you claim about God, the revelation you believe you've received about God from the scriptures, like the book I mentioned in our church hour, Critiquing God. You can't critique, they can't critique God, so they, they in, instead critique and criticize those who stand for God and claim to speak for God or claim to know God and are trying to live for God. Find character flaws with them, and thus you've disprove the existence of their God. You haven't disproved anything. All you've proven is that people are weak and people have weak wills and people can give in any number of temptations. So can Christians. That doesn't disprove God or doesn't mean there's a character flaw in God himself. But you go forth bearing his reproach. When our young people are preaching on the sidewalk, and I've mentioned this before. They pass out a track to someone walking by. Fifteen feet later, they see some doofus, you know, throws it on the ground. He's not throwing it because he's afraid of what might be in it. He knows exactly what's in it. That's why he's throwing it on the ground. You know what our young people do? They keep passing out tracks anyway. Let's go unto him without the gate, bearing his reproach. And uh, so you put up with a lot of ridicule, you'll put up with a lot of scorn, a lot of <clears throat> gossip and backbiting and backstabbing and things of that kind because people don't want a knowledge of God. And when they see you, even if you don't get a chance to talk to them about it, in their mind, you represent everything they don't want to know about God. And so if they're cold to you, they don't, they're not as friendly to you as they are to other people, whether it's at work, at school, or at the store, wherever you go. If they're not as friendly to you as they are to somebody else, and you haven't done anything to deliberately upset them, it's because if you're trying to live for Jesus Christ, as imperfectly as that probably is, if you're trying they see in you everything about God that they don't want to know because they might have to give account of themselves. There may be some expectations from God for them. <clears throat> All right. Verse 14 in our text. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one 
to come. The literal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do have a continuing city. And eventually it'll be compared to Sodom and Egypt, Revelation 11, verse 8, wherein our Lord was crucified. Two of the most corrupt societies of the ancient world were Sodom and Egypt. And that's how bad the city of Jerusalem here on the earth is going to be. And even worse, during the uh, reign of the man of sin. <clears throat> It'll be likened to uh, Sodom and Egypt before it, it is known as the Lord is there, which we read in Ezekiel 48, verse 35. In the millennium, it'll be known as the Lord is there. Jerusalem, Hebrew, means the city of peace. That suffix, S-A-L-E-M, it takes on different variant spellings. Shalom, Solomon, Salem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. But there's no peace there now. There's nothing but tight security so the Israelis can protect themselves and have their children be able to go to school in some relative safety. And they've had to be very clever in designing and implementing modern defense technologies. The Iron Dome uh, that's blocked so many missiles coming in from Syria all the time. But then the news media in the world won't report on it. Those people, those who are dear to God, become the natural enemies of the lost world. If you're dear to God, the world's going to hate you. Jesus Christ is dear to you. He's dear to me. And so the world does what it can to mock him and use his caricature in, in uh, newspaper cartoons and put out all kinds of foolish movies about Jesus Christ. Um, and Israel and the survival of the Jewish race is dear to God. Therefore, the world lines up against Israel. They line up against the Jewish people. And it's only been the miraculous hand of God that's kept the Jewish nation around. Think about this. 70 AD, Titus, a Roman general, comes in with troops and they crucify 500 Jews outside the city gates, burn down everything they could, that could burn, destroy the temple, knock all the uh, stones down, burn anything about it that uh, was, would burn, chip off the gold overlaying any of the elements inside that temple, halt it off, Jews scrambling for their lives, and since that time, no national homeland to call their own, no army protecting them, no flag to fly to represent them, no organized form of government to centralize their thoughts and their political actions, and the hostility of all the Muslim races everywhere you go. You can go to African countries that are heavily Muslim, and you'll find nothing but anti-Semitism there, and there aren't even any Jews living there. But you'll find anti-Semitism where Jews don't even live. And then spread all over the world, Russia, African countries, Far East, Japan, European nations, United States, Canada, Latin America. You'll find Jews spread all over the world since that time. And only in modern times, the last 70, 80 years, Jews began to see an opportunity to go back to the place that God had promised to that Abraham centuries ago. And God raised up the United Nations for two purposes. Number one, to help establish the modern state of Israel. Number two, to destroy it eventually. The only two reasons the United Nations exists. They satisfied the first, helping the, United, uh, the uh, modern state of Israel to take shape back in 1948. The next big thing God has planned for them is to wipe it all out, to destroy the United Nations. They're nothing but uh, standing in the way of the work of God and the reign of Jesus Christ, trying to bring in world peace without the Prince of Peace is uh, foolishness. But it'll be known as the Lord is there when Jesus Christ begins to reign. Verse 15 
It says, by him, therefore, uh, the church is expecting new Jerusalem. That'll be our inheritance. We read in Revelation 21. And in fact, so much so that the new Jerusalem is described as a bride prepared for her husband. Because that's where you and I, the bride of Jesus Christ, will dwell, prepared for our husband, the Lord Jesus. Verse 15, But him, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips. Look back in the Old Testament to the book of Hosea. Hosea 14. <clears throat> I want to congratulate you all because you're the only church in San Bernardino County that's reading anything from the book of Hosea today. Book of Hosea and chapter 14. If you have fat fingers like I do, you fan it too quickly and you'll pass it. Hosea 14 and verses 1 and 2. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips. See that word? The calves of our lips. Uh, the offering of praise and thanksgiving to God is called the calves of our lips. 800 B.C. The prophet Hosea had an idea that there was more to making a sacrifice and offering to God than simply killing an animal. He likened the praise that comes from the mouth to be a calf offered to God. Also, Psalm 107. <clears throat> Psalm 107. And notice there verse 22. Psalm 100, 107, verse 22. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. You could find a number of verses like that in the Psalms. <clears throat> Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, Psalm 101 tells us. Psalm 100, rather. Um, that was 1100 B.C. King David knew there were more sacrifices than just those being slaughtered and burned on the altar by the priests. Verse 16, back in our text, but to do good, that's a spiritual sacrifice, and to communicate, forget not, that's also a spiritual sacrifice. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You know, giving thanks to his name, as verse 15 tells us to, is very often a genuine sacrifice because many times it's painful to thank God for things that are not very pleasant and yet you're told to do that it's easy to thank him for good things things that make us feel better things that lighten our burden that day things that stir us give us a little bit of happiness you know light at the end of the tunnel this week it's easy to thank him for those things I was talking to one of our sisters right after church a little while ago. She congratulated me on the good medical news I got last week. And I said, I'm still waiting to see what happens next. You don't live, you don't, like our kids go to summer camp, they get a great blessing, but you can't live on the mountaintop with a great experience and a great uh, revival in your heart all the time. Once you go back downhill, back to your normal uh, routine, your normal schedule, school, work, any number of things, there's going to be a challenge around the corner. It always works out that way. God doesn't let you live every day on last week's blessing. That's to prepare you for some other challenge that's going to come across your way. So I'm, with some trepidation, I'm waiting to see what comes my way next. But uh, it's very painful sometimes to thank God for things that are unpleasant. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, 
in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God wants you to give thanks. It's easy to say, thank you, God, for those things that are, that, um, are light, those things that make me feel better, those things that encourage me. Thank you for that raise I got at work. Thank you for um, a successful career. Thank you for a successful ministry. Thank you for those blessings that uh, I wasn't expecting, but God, you allowed them to come anyway. Thank you for all of those. It's easy to thank you for the good things. We run back, if you will, to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 20. It's easy to say, thank you, God, for the health I enjoy. Thank you for the roof over my head, the food on my table every night. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 20. Paul writes, giving thanks always for the good things? No. For all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You got that new job. That's easy to thank God for. You got fired from that job three months later. That's not easy to thank God for. You got a new car. Thank God for that. Thank, thank the Lord for that. You got in an accident with that car. That's not so easy to thank him for. You have a new girlfriend. Now, I have great hopes for this relationship. You have a new boyfriend. And that falls apart not long after. You're supposed to thank God for that too. These things are not easy to say thank you for. And yet, when you do, the Bible says, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You give thanks to God for the good and the bad, for the purpose of pleasing God. That's why you give thanks. Not because it feels good to you, but you're doing it to please Him. If you do it, He says, with those sacrifices, He's well pleased. How many want to please God with your life? Yeah. I do. I'm hoping those of you who watch our sermons on, on the internet I hope you want to please God with your life. Well, then you have to say thank you for every trial. Thank you for every problem. Thank you for every inconvenience. Thank you for every disappointment. Thank you for every setback, as well as thank you for that blessing. Thank you for that new job. Thank you for that new set of clothes I got. Thank you for that raise. Thank you for that extra something someone gave to you. You have to thank God for all of it. And if you're only thanking God for the good things, you're not fulfilling the scriptures. I don't know that God would be pleased with a Christian who only says thank you when they get their way. You know, when you grow up, you look, you're disappointed as a kid when your mom and dad tell you no, right? You're disappointed when, I was hoping we'd go to Disneyland next, dad, next week, but dad says he has to work, we can't go. I was hoping we'd go to the beach. I was hoping I'd get to do this. I was hoping I'd get that new bike for Christmas. But I got all these other stuff. I got a mountain of stuff, but I didn't get the bike. You know, you're disappointed when you don't get what you want growing up. But when you get older, especially when you become a parent, you look back and say, you know, my mom and dad had a lot of wisdom. They loved me. They cared for me. They tried to take care of me and look out for me. They wanted me to succeed. They wanted me to stay healthy. They didn't want me to get in trouble. They wanted me to do my schoolwork. They wanted me to achieve something and not bring embarrassment on the family. And so many times they had to say no, but many times they did say yes. And so when you're looking back on, the, on your life and you consider what your parents had to do, overall, you thank God for everything. That's just the way we are. You thank God for every good and every bad thing that uh, came my way growing up. And so while it may be difficult to say thank you, God, for that disappointment, that thing that broke my heart, in the big picture, one day you look back and say, you know what, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I said thank you to God. It kept me from 
harboring any bitterness or resentment towards the person that disappointed me. So, it's a painful sacrifice to give him thanks for all things. But he says, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You give thanks because you want to please God. And lastly, the word communicate, there in verse uh, 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. He uses it in the same way. He uses it back here. Go back here to Galatians 6. We'll, we'll stop here. Galatians 6 and verse 6. And this is one I'll be truthful with. This is hard for me to explain or expound upon because it's kind of personal for someone like me who's trying to teach the Bible. But Galatians 6, verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Communicate means to give, to offer aid and assistance, or we would say in the modern times, money. The workman is worthy of his, or the laborer is la worthy of his hire, the Bible says. And so if someone has taught you the Bible, then it shouldn't be difficult for you to say, I'm willing to give to support that and keep it going on. I'm just going to leave it at that. But that's what he means. Communicate. Uh, that's why all these TV preachers want to get involved in communications. <laughs> they want to have a great communications ministry. By the way, oh, we'll close with this side note. Yesterday, I was working a funeral service. I had this same suit on, as you can tell. <laughs> and uh, this uh, woman minister, or minstrels, I call them minstrels. You can spell it any way you want to spell it. She's with the, uh, well, I want to give the name of the church, but her title is Reverend, blah, 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 Restorative Justice Minister. Restorative Justice Minister on her business card. And I had to ask, forgive me, but uh, what does that mean, Restorative Justice Minister? I don't think she even knew. <laughs> well, uh, I try to work with families who uh, have suffered violence or they have committed violence, they're behind bars, and I try to um, get them past the challenges they face, to get them, you mean, it says even some people have committed murder, they're in jail, they need someone to come and be a help to them and encouragement. No, they're murderers to be put to death. That's what I wanted to say. I have to bite my tongue too often because, you know, you never know you're going to see that minister again soon and she'll raise an issue out of it, but so um, I was going to toss this in the trash, but I thought I'd bring it here for uh, comic relief this, uh, this morning. Anyway, restorative justice minister. Okay, now let's close right there and uh, pick up there verse 17, God willing, next week.